sometimes it's easy to fall into stereotyping, to nod and say, yeah, we know who that is. We've seen that before. We know exactly what you're talking about. And yet, so often Jesus challenges those stereotypes, uses them to help us to see beyond. And that's what happens in today's story, where Jesus gives us a Pharisee and a tax collector and a lesson in righteousness. Welcome to St Ninian's Church in Stonehouse. My name is Stuart and I get to be the minister here. We're so glad that you could join us at this time. We're glad that you found your way to us and want you to know that you are loved by God and welcome here. Today, Avril reads for us and leads us in our prayers. So let's dive in and see what this story has to teach us today. Luke chapter 18 verses 9 to 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other one a tax collector. Right. This should be pretty straightforward because in the world of Luke's gospel, the Pharisees are the butt of all the stories. And the tax collectors are lovable rogues who end up doing good, right? It looks so straightforward, so simple, so easy to work out. The Pharisee thanks God that he's not a sinner like the tax collector over there. And what kind of attitude is that? How self-righteous, how arrogant. Meanwhile, the tax collector knows that he's a sinner and asks God for mercy. And one of them goes home justified before God. I mean, which one would you rather be? It's an easy choice, right? But it's a trap. A great big trap. Because this is a parable. Jesus could easily have told the people he was talking to, those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. He could have told them to wind their necks in, have a little humility. But Jesus doesn't do that. He tells a parable instead, one of those tricky stories that we are never supposed to just take at face value. We're supposed to take the story and poke it and prod it and pull in all the threads to see what we're left with. So let's tread carefully, because there are problems with just about everything in this seemingly simple story. And there's one of those really problematic translation choices that make the whole story fall apart in the end. This is a parable. This is a story that isn't really a tax collector and a Pharisee who go to the temple at the same time. This incident doesn't actually happen. The characters are chosen carefully and then massively exaggerated to make a point. The Pharisee is completely over the top. He fasts twice a week and gives a tenth of everything he has and nobody does that and there's no biblical command to do it either. The Pharisee is going way beyond what's required of him. It's self-righteous nonsense. He's a comedy character and that's how comedy works, isn't it? We take something real and we exaggerate it for effect. I said at the start that the Pharisees are on the receiving end in Luke's Gospel. But that's not actually fair. They're a big part of the story. But Luke gives us Pharisees who are suspicious of Jesus, who love money and who like their status far too much and abuse their power. But he also gives us Pharisees who invite Jesus to dinner who warned Jesus that Herod is about to get him, and who later in the story, in the book of Acts, also written by Luke, 
will vouch for the disciples in front of the council. So the Pharisees are treated like most groups and not actually often singled out as a problem. Like all groups, some members are good and others are not so good. The same could be true of, of tax collectors. We make all kinds of assumptions about tax collectors in the Bible. They are collaborators. They work with the Romans, the occupiers. They've sold out their own communities for cash. They're all liars and cheats who steal from people, skimming a bit for themselves. And nobody likes them. And that's the setup. Jesus gives us two characters who nobody would want to be. Nobody would want to be that over-the-top religious fanatic. And nobody wants to be a sellout cheating. And nobody wants to be a sellout cheating tax collector. But here they both are in the same story. The Pharisee and the tax collector are both in the temple, praying to God. It's probably worth taking a moment at this point to, to talk a bit about the religious purity system. We talk a lot about people who are excluded from the temple worship. And they are excluded for a variety of reasons. People with skin diseases, those who have been in contact with the dead, those who are bleeding. What doesn't exclude you from the temple is behaviour or reputation, or even not being Jewish. The temple was the place to go and worship God and to pray. And that's what the Pharisee and the tax collector are both doing, with equal access to the temple and equal access to God. So let's take a look at their prayers. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, even like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. What's the problem with that? The Pharisee's giving thanks to God that he's able to lead a life where he can keep the commandments and he's able to give more than required. He's a good man, doing everything that's asked of him and more. So why do we react so negatively to him? It's a perception of his tone. He sounds like he's bragging. Look at me. I'm so good. Not like them. We have a sense that somehow... He's putting on a show. Amy Jill Levine writes about this story and in her explanation she speaks of an ancient Jewish prayer that dates from a couple of hundred years after Jesus' time and it's attributed to Rabbi Judah. It's a prayer that her own son was taught at his Jewish school. It goes like this. Blessed be you, Lord, who did not make me a Gentile. Blessed be you, Lord, who did not make me uneducated. Blessed be you, Lord, who did not make me a woman. Talk about tone. But here's what we miss. Gentiles were not under the law, and so they were not expected to keep it. The uneducated couldn't be expected to understand all of the law and its implications. And women were exempt from many of the time-bound requirements of the law because well, it was recognised that their time was not their own. The prayer recognises and gives thanks to God that the man making the prayers is not any of these things and so has a special responsibility and the privilege of being able to keep the law fully. So perhaps that's what the Pharisee is talking about in his prayer. That's his understanding. It's his responsibility to do the best that he can and to give thanks for that opportunity. But what about the tax collector? Standing far off, he wouldn't even look up to heaven. But he was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We're perhaps drawn more to this honest prayer. The tax collector admits that he's a sinner. He seems ashamed, beating his chest in an act of penitence. His prayer to God is for mercy. So what's the problem here? Firstly, he's putting on just as much a show as the Pharisee. And secondly, perhaps more importantly, it's what he doesn't say. He doesn't say sorry. He's not going to go home and change his job. And so we make all kinds of assumptions about this guy. He must be a liar and a cheat because he's a tax collector, a collaborator. But the story doesn't tell us that. Why couldn't he be an honest tax collector? Taking only what he's owed. Saving people from being scammed and extorted. Jesus ends by saying, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his home justified rather than the other. But isn't that exactly what Jesus has been warning against? 
He's telling this story to people who think they have some kind of inside track to God. That they are righteous, but in their righteousness they show contempt for those they see as not being as good as them. Does this parable really end up in an either-or situation? And if it does, isn't that a problem? The text uses rather than, instead of. And this is the problem I mentioned earlier. The word translated as rather is the Greek word para. And to translate para as rather is perfectly fine. But para can also mean alongside, like a parallel line. Here are two men, completely unlike in almost every way, but yet together in the temple, praying as best as they're able to God. God who loves them both the same. So here's a thought. A question, perhaps, that this parable throws up now that we've moved beyond these easy stereotypes. Can one person's righteousness save another? Yes, of course it can. That's the plot of thousands of books and movies, the hero laying down their life for others. And it's the story of our faith. This is chapter 18 of Luke's Gospel. And Jesus is well on the way to Jerusalem, where he, a righteous man, blameless and free from sin, will give his life to save all of us. We are invited to become more like Christ. Perhaps the flaw in the Pharisee is that, like those Jesus is talking to, he doesn't see the connection between himself and the tax collector. What's missing from the scene is compassion, a word that means to enter into another's suffering. Perhaps the Pharisee can show that living out the law is possible. He could be an encouragement, a role model. But it's not enough for the Pharisee to live a blameless life if that somehow sets him apart from those who need his help. What good is it to live that blameless life but never help anyone? It's much easier to live a righteous life when you're not surrounded by the trials and temptations of daily living. That's why monasteries and convents exist, so people can take themselves off from the world. But for most people, including the tax collector in this story, that's just not possible. He can't give up his job, he can't get another one. He has to go home and live his life in his community with all the difficulties that that brings him. These two men are in the temple together because faith is found and worked out in community. And that faith, our faith, only becomes real and useful when a righteous man walks alongside one who struggles. And together... They make life better. For this whole thing to work, for it to make real change in people's lives, we have to be connected. We have to overcome the huge distance in the story between the the Pharisee and the tax collector because those same gaps exist in our own community. And that's Jesus' example to us. And that's the challenge of this parable. To step outside of those cheap and easy judgments and to be compassionate. To use any righteousness that we have for the good of all, to stand alongside those who need our help the most. And in doing so, bring the love of God to everyone.
Let us pray. God, in your eyes all the world is one. Your compassion reaches all of creation. May we have your eyes of compassion. May we never look down on others or turn aside from their pain, but reach out to make a difference. May we know that you equip us to effect change in our communities and in the world. So help us to risk our comfort to speak out against injustice. Help us to put aside our complacency to act for those who are persecuted. Help us to share all that we have to give to those who are hungry or homeless. God, give us your heart to serve our neighbours and to see in the face of all we encounter the face of Christ our Lord, in whose words we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. As we go from here, may we go in peace, may we go in humility, may we go with and under grace, may we go in love and the blessing of God, known to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us, those whom we love and those we find hardest to love, today and always. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you.